Good morning and welcome to a special uh, lecture by Senator Yvonne Boyer on Indigenous health history. And this is a lecture that's part of a series of lectures on Indigenous health history uh, that are delivered um, to students who are registered at the University of Winnipeg in History 3590, Indigenous Health History. And um, so what happens is we're going to be asking Dr. Uh, Senator Boyer to um, give us a talk for about 20 or 30 minutes, and then we're going to close down um, the Zoom, and we're going to open up um, the room for questions uh, with Dr. Boyer. Thanks to people in 1L10, the studio at the University of Winnipeg, as well as Crystal. Um, and uh, I want to um, introduce uh, Senator Yvonne Boyer to our class today. Uh, she's a lawyer. She's also a member of the Métis Nation of Ontario and has ancestral roots here um, in Winnipeg and Red River, as well as the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan. Uh, Senator Boyer has made and is continuing to make significant contributions to our understanding of inequities in Canada um, and in Canadian healthcare specifically and the experiences of Indigenous people. Her approach to the topic um, through Aboriginal rights and treaty law provides a really critical perspective and important evidence uh, for how we understand the past and imagine a better future. So earlier this week, um, there was a second reading of a bill that um, Senator Boyer is leading in um, the Senate. And you can see um, on the screens uh, an image from a recording of that. And you can see that um, on YouTube. There's a link on YouTube that is her full um, speech, which is about 25 minutes long, um, that provides an excellent overview of the history of uh, sterilization, of eugenics in Canada, and um, also about how this will make a, a kind of intervention into legal um, parameters around um, sterilization. Her bill uh, specifically criminalizes coerced sterilization. Um, so I appreciate so much uh, that you're, you're giving us your time today, um, Senator Boyer, and um, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Dr. McCallum. I appreciate that introduction. And yes, I have been very absorbed in the issue of forced and coerced sterilization. First of all, I want to acknowledge that I am on the traditional unceded territories of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. And we know that the people of these nations are the original stewards of the land. And it's important that we show our humility, our gratefulness, and respect for their stewardship by acknowledging them and thanking them. So I am Yvonne Boyer, Senator for Ontario. I was appointed in 2018. I'm about to go into my fifth year. I was raised in southern Saskatchewan. My grandparents came from the Red River, Manitoba, northern United States. They are Chi Cree and Chippewa. And uh, my mother was Irish as Irish could be with the red hair and a fiery personality. She, uh, her ancestors came from Northern Ireland. So I was raised with brothers and about a million cousins. And I learned how to have a really good scrap. I was a nurse before I was a lawyer, and I've been pretty much involved with the topic of sterilization my whole life, whether I actually knew it or not. My dad was the youngest of 14 children, 12 that survived. My Aunt Lucy, I lived with. I was born on her birthday, which made this relationship very, very special. She spent 10 years in a tuberculosis sanatorium, Fort San and Fort Quipel, and she spent five of those years in a body cast. She was able to see her family once in those 10 years. And because I, I actually slept with her and my Uncle Pat, my bedtime stories were all about the sand and what it was like. She talked about experiments on the kids. She talked about being a brown skid child. She talked about the metal frames of the bed. She talked about the white starch sheets. She talked about being put out on the uh, patio, not the patio, the uh, balcony with um, warm blankets and a heated brick at her feet. 
and resting, doing nothing but eating, trying to eat well, and uh, resting, and that was all. And my bedtime stories were all about the sand, and she still whispers in my ear about the monsters that walk the halls at night. She called them the wowies. The wowies walk the halls. So as we heard a little earlier, I am the sponsor of Bill S-250. It's a private member's bill. It's called an act to amend the criminal code sterilization procedures. And it proposes to amend section 268 of the criminal code, which addresses aggravated assault offenses. So, um, S-250 creates a new offense for sterilization procedures without consent. So the, the monsters that my aunt talked about are the ones who this bill is directed at. And let me tell you about the bill that I introduced in the Senate in June. And a couple of days ago, I did a second reading speech on it. I also would like to introduce Sky and Veronica. They're my staff that are online here. And I'm going to ask Sky to put the YouTube link in the chat and any other reports that I mentioned today as well. So thank you, Sky and Veronica, for always making sure I'm where I'm supposed to be. So the first question I'm always asked when people discover that I'm working on this topic is that, how can that still be happening? Didn't that happen a long time ago? And it's not a thing anymore. And the simple answer is no, it's happening today. And at this very moment, women are being coerced while they are pregnant and or in other situations or have given birth. And I want to talk about some of the underlying reasons because that's very applicable to Indigenous health today. So we know, and uh, you probably all are aware of the role that Indigenous women had in the families and the communities as commanding the highest respect because they were the givers of life. They were able to reproduce and they were the keepers of the traditions and the practices and the customs of their nations. They had a sacred status because they were able to bring life into the world. So very much unlike these indigenous ways of being and knowing that was based on gender balance and respect, the British common law developed through a different system. They went through the legal traditions of the Romans, the Normans, church canon law and Anglo-Saxon law. And these legal traditions considered married women to be under the protection of their husbands and first their fathers and then their husbands. They didn't have any social or legal status, but were considered chattels and dependent on the male in their family. Birthing at that point was a medical procedure that was considered important only to extend the male patriarchal line. And that's why we see in our genealogy, the indigenous women, there's not much written about them, but the men is pretty well documented. So we see initially the clash of the knowledge systems quickly and early on. So we've got Roman law, we've got indigenous law that are that's about to clash. So in contrast to British common law, women were having a sacred identity that was maintained through a very intricate knowledge system of balance and harmony. They were, were economically, socially, and politically powerful, and they were anchors to their family and closely linked to the land. And because land acquisition became a primary goal of the colonizers, various laws, such as the Indian Act, regulations, residential schools, policies and Christian edicts were applied to the identity of Indigenous women and it forced them into a oppressed position in society and that's one just one of the reasons why we have forced and coerced sterilization today. Um, Dr. McCallum talked about eugenics yes in the speech I went quite uh, deep into eugenics and we know that Canada has a history of eugenics because they sterilized people that they considered unfit. And because of the social strata of Indigenous women, they were easy targets. So the eugenics movement what began in um, 19th century England, and it was used in Canada, the US, many European and Southern countries, and it was made famous in Nazi Germany. The, the two provinces that actually upheld sexual sterilization acts were Alberta and British Columbia from 1928 to 1973. 
There was a eugenics board that was comprised of only four people that oversaw all the cases for sterilization. Um, Saskatchewan, Manitoba and Ontario also introduced similar bills, but they didn't become law. But what they did do is create an underpinning in our Canadian fabric that sterilization is actually a good method to control the population. And for Indigenous women, the impact on health and the stigma of being wrongfully sterilized is absolutely insurmountable. And we know that these laws have now been repealed, but the notions still underpin our health policies that we see that we see today. And they are another mitigating factor to why we have forced and coerced sterilization. Before I became a senator in 2018, I was asked by the Saskatoon Health Region who had contacted me because there had been, there had been some Indigenous women that had said that they had been sterilized in the Saskatoon Hospital against their wishes. And so they came forward and um, two women came forward, Tracy Benab and Brenda Pelche, and they were the targets of a horrendous amount of racism and attacks on social media. And they were the catalyst that started it. And once they came forward, two more women came forward, two more women came forward, two more, and then pretty soon there was 11 women that came forward that had been, that were Indigenous, that had been sterilized against their will, were coerced into sterilization, or did not even sign consent forms. So the Saskatoon Health Region didn't have to do this, but they did. They commissioned myself and um, Dr. Judith Bartlett, and we interviewed seven of these women who'd been sterilized against their will. So the external review, we interviewed them, we wrote a report, and it provided recommendations for change, including calls to action relating to support and reparations, cultural training, education, law, and policy reform. It also did something very, very important. It laid the foundation for the class action lawsuits that are currently occurring all across Canada. In Saskatchewan, Alberta, Ontario, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, British Columbia, and now Quebec. And I suspect every province in the country will have class action lawsuits uh, occurring because I believe this is going on everywhere. After I became a senator, so 2017, I did that report. In 2018, my first speech was on sterilization. And following that speech, the media started becoming more interested in the issue. And uh, we did all kinds of interviews worldwide. We had interviews from Belgium, Spain, France, Japan, others everywhere. They covered the issue, even the the people I spoke to from India said, we thought Canada was a, you know, you know, a nice place. And um, I said, well, this is what's going on here. Here's the history of the in Indigenous health care. And it's not just Indigenous, but I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So in 2020, things quietened down with COVID. But again, they started arising in 2022. And through these years, I've done, you know, numerous speaking engagements all across Canada. And women always came forward, came forward and said, it happened to me, it happened to me, it happened to me. And every time women come forward, it empowers another one to come forward. And so we see more and more all the time of women that have been sterilized against their will. My office is also, um, it takes many, many calls about it. In 2019 and 22, the Senate Standing Committee on Human Rights completed two studies on the issue of forced and coerced sterilization. Um, in the first study, we generally heard from experts on the topic of sterilization, but in report two, the scars we carry, forced and coerced sterilization of persons in Canada, and I'll ask Sky to put a link on for both of these. Um, both, of, both of the reports provided strong recommendations and calls to action on the eradication of this of uh, forced sterilization. A additionally, from the international perspective, the United Nations Committee Against Torture and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and two special UN rapporteurs have also called on Canada to take concrete action on this issue. 
But I want to stop there because I want I want you to hear from the women because the women have asked me to. The women have asked me to share stories. And these are women that have been sterilized. And for some of you, this may be shocking, but for those who know and have experienced racism themselves in Canada's healthcare system, these stories are way too familiar. And the survivors want you to know what happened to them. So SAT is a Cree woman who, after giving birth to her sixth child, was presented with a consent form for her sterilization. Upon reading this form, she heard her late husband exclaim, and I quote, I am not blank blank signing that. And she was wheeled right into the operating room over her protests. She tried to wheel herself away and escape, but the doctor wheeled her right back in. She repeatedly cried out, I don't want this, through tears as the nurses held her while they administered the epidural. When she was in the operating room, she kept asking the doctor if it was done yet, and he retorted, yes, cut, tied, and burnt. There's nothing getting through that. In another example, a young Indigenous woman told me, during my spontaneous delivery, I recall being asked if I wanted to have my tubes tied due to a cancellation in the surgeon's schedule. I was in labor for two days prior to going to the hospital. It's well recognized how sleep deprivation creates incapacity and that life-changing decisions should not be made while in that state. Yet within two hours of giving birth, I was in the operating theater getting sterilized. An Anishinaabe woman told me about her forced sterilization when she was 18 and said, how can I fight these people who've already deemed my life unworthy and what is more they have deemed my unborn baby unworthy so much so that they backed me into a corner and deemed my right to bear life as unworthy they cut me down and what's more they cut any chance of me ever having the god-given right to further bear life this system became my judge jury and executioner what's worse they became that to my unborn child as well these disturbing experiences really point to the critical importance of establishing major safeguards to sterilization procedures and speak to directly to the need of greater accountability when it comes to establishing free prior and informed consent. And we know that these stories are horrifying, but perhaps the most impactful story that I personally heard from a clerk at a small hotel in Saskatchewan. It was late in the evening and I was checking into the hotel after a long day's work. And as I was checking in, the young woman in the counter looked at me and said, I know you, you're a senator. And I said, yes, I'm a senator. And she said, you're the sterilization senator. And I was a bit taken back and I said, yes, well, that's an area that I do work in. And she looked at me deep in the eyes and the tears started welling up. And she said, it happened to me too and she burst into tears. It turns out that she'd had four children and she was sterilized against her will. And now it was 10 years later, she was with a new partner and she wanted to have another child. But that choice was ripped away from her without her knowledge or consent many years ago. While the extent, exact extent and severity of forced sterilization isn't determined, my office has documented over 12,000 12,000 Indigenous women in Canada who've been coerced or forced to be sterilized between 1971 and 2018. So how is this bill going to stop the atrocities? Now, I've got the bill in my hand, and I'm not going to go over it with you, but the bill actually adds the issue of anybody that performs a sterilization procedure is guilty of an indictable offense and liable to imprisonment for a term not exceeding 14 years. Consent is very is listed in here. There are safeguards listed in here. And a final consent that the person must be able to withdraw their final consent before the the um, sterilization occurs. And it's a short bill. And uh, if you want to read it, maybe Sky can put it on the on the uh, chat as well. So it's just one tool that will stop, help stop the eradication of the practices. The implementation of the bill helps to establish a legislative framework that recognizes that 
uh, forced and coerced sterilization has in the legacy of colonization, racism, and systemic, systemic discrimination in Canada. It needs to be addressed in a genuine way, and I am, I am going to make sure that this bill moves right through the Senate as quickly as possible and uh, is able to move over to the House for the same process and becomes law by the end of June. So that's, um, that's my hope that there will be changes. I just want to briefly mention some of the things that, that my office does. And um, there's many, my office is, I mentioned it being like a clearinghouse. And we get calls often and emails and, and people find me that have been sterilized or there's some health healthcare issues that they contact me about. Sometimes women call me and say, I've been trying to get pregnant for four years. And I remember having a surgery, but I don't know what happened. And I would guide them on how to get your medical records. And I, I'll help you decipher them to see if you were actually sterilized. The, um, the, I want to tell you some of the work the government has been doing as well. In January 2020, there was a conference with government and community leaders, and it was a good step in the right direction. Um, many, many people got together that were the heads of their departments and, or the organizations they represent, and they all pulled themselves together to adopt a declaration to end the forced and coerced sterilization of Indigenous women and girls. So that was a good start. And then we had Joyce Echequan's death, and it was so tragic. And it sparked the federal racism and healthcare working group meetings. There were, I believe there was three events, but uh, I'm not quite sure. I was, I, I think I was at all of them and speaking at them, but I'm not quite sure what's come of it since then. There's always so much going on with the government. And before Joyce Echequan, we had Brian Sinclair that all of you are familiar with. I know that. The federal government has a working group. It's a very cohesive group. It's Indigenous women's working group that consists of NGOs and midwives and others that uh, are very focused on stopping sterilization. And the most important thing that I have to share with you is that over the past three years, myself and a few other people have been working towards a survivor's society for reproductive justice, and it has now been incorporated. So we have strong Indigenous matriarchs that are on the board, and we have uh, over 200 members that are survivors that are directing the board in what they want done. And it's just getting going, but you're going to remember this name, Survivors Society, no, Survivors Circle for Reproductive Justice, Survivors Circle for Reproductive Justice. You'll hear that name again because it's the survivors that are speaking about what they want and how to do it because they're the only ones that know. So um, there's issues that they'll be working on. They'll, I mean, what can be done is educating new physicians and lawyers about the practice, reviewing provincial requirements for licensing, and really, women really need to know what their rights are. So that's um, about all I want to say. I do want to quickly mention that there has to be national standards for consent and that would be that would be really important so um I'm, i think i'm pretty close to the end of my time here so i'm going to say thank you very much for the opportunity to share these words and to um i'm hoping to plant seeds i'm hoping that each one of you can take these words and take them back and do your own seed planting about how this practice of forced and coerced sterilization has to stop because it's happening right now and it's got to stop. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Senator Boyer. Um, again, I want to uh, reiterate that the question and answer section will now begin uh, with our class. And so we're going to ask people who have registered with the Zoom to leave now. Wow, that was uh, just incredible. Um, I had a ton of questions already before <laughs> before this started, and now I've even got more. But I'll I'll open it up to students if there's anybody who has anything that they are that they'd like to ask or comments is fine. 